Hi, here is Mark Vulenius. Did you know that most of the technological innovation were actually developed for the purpose that was never used later in the use of that technology? So there is something interesting there. And that goes from telephones to text messages to all kinds of gadgets. Hear me out, I want to explain why. Now, technological innovations have been the backbone of industrial revolution and the modernization for the past 200 years. Countless innovations, countless solutions, new ways of dealing with the existing issues and problems and challenges. Yet, which are those type of innovation that actually spread into the world it's a little bit mysterious source. It's something that we don't know what is the, exactly the recipe, which is exactly the same thing that if you try to build and create the hugely popular song, and you can hear thousands and thousands of songs that are hugely popular, yet if you try to build it, to make it, it's impossible. You don't know the recipe. So it seems like it's a purely a type of the random process. What is actually those songs that become hugely popular? The same is true with the innovations and the technologies. You cannot really know which of those technologies are the ones that are, are spreading out and becoming a kind of a mainstream. But we do have some sort of methods, some sort of tools. When we look at the history of the technological innovation, that we, from which we can see that, well, there are some ways that we can build better understanding how we can actually build the type of technologies that become hugely successful. Let me explain in more details what are those three methods. The first method, I like to call it Jobs method, according to Steve Jobs, obviously. Steve Jobs, as we all know, was the guy who invented the Mac personal computers, Apple computers, later iPhones, iPods, and so many others. What made him particularly good in predicting what type of the technologies people like to adopt was not that he would go out in the street or make a survey to ask people what do they want. He knew that they would respond to him that they want something which already exists. They cannot imagine very well what would be those type of the future demands, future ways of dealing with the world, dealing with the information flows, dealing with how they can entertain them themselves or whatever they have as their desires. That they are very much bound to what they have seen that far. So he thought that it's not very useful. Instead, he started to imagine what is it that people would like to really to be about in the future? What type of the jobs, what type of the works, what type of the entertainment they would like to have. And he came to the conclusion that, well, since people like very much comfort, they would like to have a type of the personal computers where all kinds of information from the world is gathered and then held by the softwares to actually to source out that type of information that is really, really usable for them. And all this in the one gadget, in the one screen, easily approachable, easily usable, easily changeable too. So he had this idea at the time when microcomputers were more of thought as intelligent typewriters, but not much more than that. But with his very different kind of idea, what this computer would be standing for, he became a legendary pioneer. 
The other example of this kind comes actually here from Finland, where in the early 1990s uh, there was a, a new elected CEO in the company called Nokia. And these guys got the idea that let's work on the mobile phone in a such a way that the mobile phone itself would become something that every person in the world would carry in their pocket. Now mind you, in the early 1990s, the mobile phones that was new, known at that time were mostly those type of five tiles, kind of a weight, hard, hard, hard packages that we were carrying from one place to another. There was not an easiness, not a comfort uh, on those days. But still, it was a mobile phone that you can, you can use wherever you go. Now they changed that idea and they were laughed at the idea because at that time it was still thought that, okay, maybe business people would like to use more extensively that in the future, but ordinary lay person, no, no. There was no idea how possibly that that could be needed by, the, by people. Um, so they came up with something really revolutionary. But because they were consistent and because they knew that this type of the dream is not only something that can be realized, but also something that people would like to have, that they were anticipating again the future need, that made this type of the dreaming very powerful. And what resulted? was, of course, the worldwide success. The second method, we could call it a pioneering analysis. And it follows that whenever there is something new and interesting appearing, we should be very fast of, lo of looking closer to that. What is it there that is appearing? For instance, my back on my own research, I noticed uh, with the research group that I was working with um, that in Japan there was something interesting cooking in ways they were using the navigation. Now navigation today is a no-brainer but in those days and we go back 20 years ago it was far from being a no-brainer. It was not a feature that we had in our gadgets in our computers or in our mobile phones. But in Japan in those days, there was already some first technologies that had been developed. And Japanese seemed to be very uh, interested in using them and it was kind of a spreading fast. We realized that this might be something that is spreading much beyond Japan the moment when it comes clear that well, navigation in the mobile phone, as with the computers, is actually a great asset. We need to navigate in our urban centers. We need to navigate in, in the way that we are covering uh, far distances. And what, do, what did we have before? We have the maps. But the problem with the map is that it never says exactly where we are at the point. While us, this navigation uh, software gave us that possibility to look how actually we move in the map. And, and lo and behold, five years after we did our investigation, then the navigation technology started to spread all around. So doing this kind of a pioneering analysis, looking at where is the front, and it can happen in any parts of the world. Where is the front may give you a very good idea what is something there that might develop into substantial trend, substantial market, substantial new way of using our technologies. The third method that we should use when uh, predicting the technologies can be called something that the future is called weak signals. So detecting weak signals, detecting that something is appearing 
in the different part of the world, though it's still very much in the marginal. Now take an example of electric cars. Back in 2010, there were very few Western or US car makers that really believe that electric cars will be their future. In fact, they were resisting the whole idea and said it's impossible that electric car should be spreading uh, into the market. They saw just no reason that to happen. Still, there were some producers, mostly in Japan, that were actually very, very confident that electric cars will be the future. So, Toyota, Honda, Nissan, those three in particular, they started to invest a lot of money to these technologies that enable electric cars to become out from the marginal into the center. And lo and behold, today, all car makers around the world are investing heavily. And the expectation is that the next five to 10 years, all the new cars will be sold as electric cars in most part of the world. Understanding that there is a new pattern emerging, understand that hmm, signals here and signals there, when combined, it means actually a transformation. In this case, it's a transformation of the car industry. When that happens, we should not be in the position where we suddenly start, if we, particularly if we are in that business, that we are suddenly seeing that, okay, everybody's talking about it, even taxi drivers are talking about it. If that happens, we know we are massively late. And that is exactly what happened to many European car makers and particularly in the US car makers. So, funny enough, the, the history is full of those examples when the incumbent sort of existing uh, industry leaders did not see what is coming next. For instance, there is um, um, a legendary in example from IBM back in 1940s when the first computers were developed. The CEO, uh, Thomas Watson, uh, said famously at that time that he sees that there is no place for more than four computers in the whole world. Because his visualization and image of the future was that we have these four huge supercomputers that cater for all the information need in the world. Similarly, a couple of decades before, Lord Kelvin, who was the chairman and president of the Royal Society, 1895, said that he sees that it is impossible that any type of a heavier than air built machines could fly. Now, only a little after that, von Wright brothers were able to fly their first flying machine called airplane. In 1977, Ken Olson, the CEO of, of Digital Equipment Corp, said that he cannot understand how anybody would like to have a computer at their home in 1977. And he was one of the leaders of that industry at the time. So all these examples show us that Predicting the future is not easy, even if you are insider, even if you are the one who is supposed to know. Maybe in those cases and in many other cases, it is exactly the fact that you are inside that technology, inside that industry that makes you blind for the changes. The fundamental reason why all this is happening is that we humans are built 
to think linearly. That means that our ways of anticipating and predicting the future is more like tomorrow it's gonna be the same as today. Just maybe a little minor changes, but nothing more than that. And in most of the cases, the reality proves that to be the case. But we need to st start to learn to actually to see when the change is coming because that is what makes us the capacity to actually to predict the future which is never particularly if you go a little bit longer it's never the same as today but then there is another factor there at play as well for whatever we invent we as humans tend to tame that invention into something else. Just a couple of examples. Take the telephone. Graham Bell, some 150 years ago, famously invented and patented what he called the telephone, which was more like a transmitting the oral voice from one place to another. And he thought that was the importance. But the importance of the telephone was actually uh, uh, invented much later when we started to use it much more on the, on the globally and it turned out that communication is actually much more important than just transmitting your own voice into somewhere else. It is the process of communication that was importantly supported by the telephones and that's why the telephone uh, spread in all its different forms into the world. The same holds true for such inventions like text messages. Text message, the first idea of the text message was in, invented actually here in, in Finland uh, or at least by the Finnish engineer who thought that this is a great idea that I can uh, send a message to someone that somebody out there, whether it's a phone box, whether it's another person, can receive the information that I want to deliver. And it took quite a long time and quite a lot of development of the technologies, more than 10 years, actually more towards the 15 years, that it developed to its present form, which is like a, more like a communication tool, interaction tool. That's why there is not any more that we are using these simple messages that we send to one another, but actually we communicate via WhatsApp and with so many other applications. So again, you see that this taming of the technologies for our own purposes is an integral part of the technology development and has to be understood as a part of how we predict that the future of technology we're going to be looking like. So, some practical tips. When you are inventing new technologies, try to spread out your idea and think that, is there any future need that this technology might be meeting? And what is exactly the need that you are talking about? Secondly, are there signs around in the world that tells you that something interesting is popping up? even if it's still very much in the marginal. Can you detect something of a new pattern, pattern of behavior, pattern of the needs that is emerging out there? Thirdly, play out different options, different scenarios, how people, citizens, consumers might be using it. Don't restrict yourself, don't narrow yourself into existing ways of using technologies, but spread your wings, expand your mind and your consciousness and try to imagine how your technology might be used in a different ways in the future once people have tamed the technology that you have invented. If you like this video, please share it with your friends and give me your feedback. What do you think? 
yourself is the next big technology that is stepping in. See you.